All right, so I'll do a, a very brief introduction of tonight's speaker. First, I want to welcome all of you. This is the first of a series of lectures in the Molecular Medicine Evening Lecture Program. And uh, this is the second season that we've done this. And this is a series that's sponsored by the Molecular Medicine Program at the University of Washington. This is a uh, Howard Hughes uh, Institute funded program. And the goal of this program is to bring some of the excitement at the interface between biology and medicine both to you as an audience and to incorporate some of that into PhD biomedical research training on this campus. So this is a program that's been in existence now for several years. I see several of the participants in that program in the audience and it's an opportunity in addition to getting a PhD in one of a dozen different disciplines at this institution to have contact with individuals that are trying to bring basic science to the clinic and also take clues from the clinic to improve our understanding of basic uh, human biology and human disease processes. So the lecture series is an attempt to try to pick individuals who have participated in this course, such as uh, uh, this particular um, series of courses, such as Jay, to talk about what they're doing in research and what they see as some of the most exciting aspects of the research they work on and how it might influence both patient care and our understanding of human biology. So our speaker tonight, uh, Jay Heineke, um, uh, I've known for quite a while, and I told him I'd not tell any embarrassing stories. Um, but uh, Jay uh, had originally did his bachelor's degree at Antioch. He went to Washington University to do his MD after that, and then came here to the University of Washington to uh, basically finish his medical training. He did a medicine residency and internship, and he did an endocrinology residency. And he also did something that was a little bit unusual. He did a research fellowship in biochemistry, and it was there that he got interested in a topic that will play in tonight's talk, which is the role of oxygen in biological systems, and especially some of the potential deleterious aspects of oxygen as they affect proteins in our blood. So this is part of the uh, theme of this evening's uh, discussion. In 2002, actually in 1991, when he finished his training here, Washington University, where he had done his medical training, uh, realized it, it, this was a good thing. They promptly hired him back as an assistant professor, and he was there through 2002 when we were lucky enough to recruit him back to this campus as a professor of medicine. And he's been here since 2002, and since 2004 has been the Karasinski Chair in the Department of Medicine in the Division of Endocrinology. So it's a great pleasure to welcome Jay to this series, and to I look forward to tonight's talk. Jay. Well, thank you very much, Ray, for that kind introduction. The real reason he's not telling any stories about me is that he doesn't want me to tell any stories about him. So it's kind of a quid pro quo here. So what I'd like to talk about tonight is, is HDL, or high-density lipoprotein. And what I hope to convince you about at the end of the evening is that maybe we know far less than we think we do about this fascinating particle. So what I'd like to do is to start off with the key players in this drama. These are highly detailed molecular models that my colleague Jack Orm constructed, uh, delineating the structure of these particles in the blood. So on the left side, we have uh, low-density lipoprotein, or LDL cholesterol. This is the bad form of cholesterol. And on the right side, we have uh, the good player, HDL cholesterol, or high-density lipoprotein. So, so what is the evidence that these proteins are in, and lipids are important in biology, and why do we call these the good and bad forms of cholesterol? Well, the original data substantiating these ideas was based on isolating these particles from the blood of human beings and looking at them in people who did and didn't have heart disease. And what rapidly became apparent was that when people had high levels of LDL cholesterol, they had a greatly increased risk of coronary artery disease. And this was first demonstrated over 30 years ago in uh, epidemiological studies, but has been confirmed over and over and over again in many different ways. It was subsequently discovered that there was also a good form of cholesterol in blood, or high-density lipoprotein. And when levels of this form of lipids and proteins are elevated, your risk for coronary artery disease goes down. 
So probably most people in the room are aware of the idea that LDL is bad for you, but I'll point out that in men under the age of 60, a low level of HDL cholesterol is a more common risk factor for heart disease than a high level of LDL cholesterol. So I guess one of the questions that always comes up is why do we have these lipoproteins if they're so potentially dangerous? And, and like all things in biology, and I was discussing this with the students earlier, there's really one driving force for this, and this is sex. If, if you don't reproduce and pass on your genes, you're a biological dead end. You really don't matter as far as the organism is concerned. And there are really two key things to being able to have sex to reproduce. You have to have adequate nutrition or food intake, and you have to be able to resist disease. And through most of, of human history, the major killers of human beings was infectious disease. And so the reason we evolved lipoproteins, I'd like to suggest, is to play a key role in nutrient delivery and disease fighting. So the underlying reason for generating these particles is that fat does not like to be in water. It's what we call hydrophobic. And so you have to deliver these particles in a very special way that I'll go into in just a minute that involves both proteins and lipids. So there are two key components of lipids or fats that are relevant to lipoprotein biology. And these are triglycerides, which we abbreviate TG. These are very nutrient-rich particles that we have to transport from our gut to our adipose tissue. The other key component of these particles is cholesterol. Now, cholesterol is not a nutrient in the traditional sense, but it plays a very key role in maintaining the integrity of membranes around cells. In fact, if you lack cholesterol, your cells are leaky, and this is a lethal phenotype in vivo. Cholesterol also plays many other roles, including the formation of hormones like estrogen and testosterone. So the problem that we confront with lipids is that we have to transport these insoluble fats through the blood in the aqueous or water environment. So the way that your body solves this problem is to make particles that are composed of both protein and lipids. And in this um, somewhat oversimplified model, the fats like triglycerides partition into the core of these spherical particles so that they avoid interacting with water. In contrast, the proteins that help solubilize these particles and also play a very important role in controlling their biological properties reside on the surface of the particles and help solubilize the insoluble fat that resides in the center of the particles. So what are diagrammed here are actually uh, four different classes of lipoproteins. Chylomicrons, which are very large, fat-rich particles that deliver fat from your diet to the adipose tissue via the liver. On the right side of the figure are VLDL and LDL, which also play a very important role in delivering fat to adipose tissue. And then on the bottom left is the HDL particle, the high-density lipoprotein particle. And the reason that these particles are high-density is they contain far more protein than lipid, and this makes them denser than the other particles. 